Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fourth video podcast for Canadian history. In this podcast, we're going to be shifting focus and really looking at how the settlement of New France developed. This was the first uh, permanent European uh, major settlement in the land that we will one day call Canada. Um, and it really was um, in competition with the English settlements to the south, which would eventually become the United States of America. So France and England, their two settlements will be the topic of the next two weeks as we sort of compare how uh, they went very different paths and then ultimately how uh, the English will eventually conquer the French and take over um, New France altogether. Um, but that's uh, a couple weeks away. So today we're going to be talking about New France. The learning objectives for this podcast are number one, describe the early history of New France and its relationship with First Nations. Number two, contrast the settlements of New France and New England. Number three, Understand the role Louis XIV and royal government had in New France. Number four, contrast the French colonies of Acadia and Canada. Those are two different places. And number five, describe the Cueillers de Bois and the expansion of French territory. So by the time we get into the mid 1600s, New France consists of two colonies. There is the colony of Acadia. This was the initial uh, French colony, and we talked a little bit about it being founded in the last podcast. Um, the interesting thing about Acadia was that um, the colony became successful largely because the uh, French settlers um, uh, had close relations, friendly relations, with the local indigenous tribes, particularly the Mi'kmaq people. And then we also uh, spoke about last week, the very first colonies in the land that Cartier um, uh, called Canada, which if you recall from last week, how we uh, think that he got confused about um, uh, uh, the word, uh, the indigenous word, Canada, and thinking that that meant that that was what the land was called, when really it was just the word for village. Uh, in any respect, uh, Canada is the other French colony, and it's along the St. Lawrence River. And so we saw last week how Samuel de Champlain uh, formed an alliance um, with the indigenous peoples, particularly the, the Huron or the Wendat peoples and the allied indigenous tribes with them, such as the Algonquin. Um, and uh, that did help those early French settlements uh, of Trois-Rivières, Quebec, and Montreal. Those were the first sort of major settlements of the Quebec uh, that were founded uh, in what is now called Quebec. Uh, in um, uh, along the St. Lawrence River, but it also uh, his alliance with the Wendat also made the French the enemies of the Haudenosaunee of the five nation Haudenosaunee or Iroquois Confederacy, which was a large nation group of indigenous peoples to the south. Um, their traditional territory uh, butted right up against the territory of the Huron Wendat and it included New York State. Um, and the south shores of Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence River. And so that's where we left off last week. And so by the mid 1600s, um, the two colonies have started to develop a fair bit. Uh, but what's interesting is, is as we move into the mid part of the century of the 17th century of the mid 1600s, we really start to see that the, the settlements along the St. Lawrence River um, are more successful, or at least they become more populated than the settlements of Acadia, which remain uh, fairly small, um, even though they were the earlier settlements. So at the same time that the French settlements were developing, to the south of the French, uh, we have the English settlements, or Great Britain, as uh, England, Scotland, um, were unified at this point, began, uh, at least by the 1700s, and we begin to speak of, of British rather than simply English. But those are original English colonies. Um, the first of them um, were right along the, um, the ocean there. Um, Virginia was the very first one. And then we would see um, a total of 13 uh, small little British colonies. 
Um, and so there along the eastern seaboard there, um, what and eventually this would in modern day become the United States of America. And to the north of them, that's where the French colonies are. And if we go far to the south, um, the area which is now Florida and, and Cuba and of course Mexico, all of that area is part of New Spain. Uh, so New England takes uh, starts to look very different from New France um, quite quickly during the 1600s. So New England um, becomes populated um, uh, much more quickly than New France. It has a large growing population um, by the end of the century. Um, and it's well developed. Uh, so there's settlements in terms of towns. Um, a lot of the forest has been cut back for agriculture. And the relationship with the indigenous people, um, with the English colonists, is very hostile for the most part. The English colonists um, are fighting with them quite frequently, and they have essentially pushed many of the, the indigenous tribes off their land and pushed them further inland. Uh, this is really a contrast to the French, which with the exception of the early days of Jacques Cartier, if you remember him from last week, he was the explorer that kidnapped uh, indigenous people and brought them back to France. Uh, with the exception of Cartier, the, for the most part, the French after that point took a much more conciliatory approach to the indigenous tribes in their area and became more friendly with them. And so we see very different approach. New France, on the other hand, remains quite small um, overall. Uh, it remains um, uh, very rural and undeveloped. Um, it's mostly an economy based on fur trading. As such, the population is almost entirely men, whereas in New England, we see whole families. So you might wonder, why did whole families move to New England, whereas we weren't seeing that happen in France? Well, it has to do partially with the environment in England at the time. And there were a multitude of different Christian religions, different ways of being Christian within England at that time. There was um, the sort of official Christian religion of England, which was Anglicanism, but then there were smaller versions of Christianity, and those smaller versions of Christianity weren't entirely able to practice their faith openly. But the King of England allowed some of those minority faiths the opportunity to be more open about their religion and practicing their faith if they would be willing to move to the new world and help found these colonies and so what that gave was an incentive for uh, whole families and communities religious communities to move to the new world and some of those early religious communities were the quakers and the Puritans, those are, are types of Christian groups. Um, and in fact, uh, if you think about like the oatmeal brand, Quaker oatmeal, you see an image of a traditional Quaker man from the mid 1600s with the with the um, hat, the, the black wide brimmed hat, which was a typical dress of a Quaker man. Um, so th these religious communities, though, formed the foundation of a British presence in the New World. And since we had whole families there that became sort of self-replicating, so to speak, very quickly the population of New England began to outstrip New France. So as I was saying, one of the reasons why New England had been able to um, grow in population so much more quickly was minority Christian religious groups were encouraged to move to the New World um, to set up camp there so that they could practice their faith openly. The fact that we have many, many different versions of Christianity um, is a relatively recent thing in Europe at that point in time. Um, and it is a result of the Protestant Reformation. And I did really briefly talk about the Protestant Reformation in the previous podcast. But what the Protestant Reformation did was shatter the unity of Christianity in Europe. For most of Christianity's history up until that point in time, there was really only one uh, way of being a Christian in Western Europe, and that was um, you were a type of Christian that nowadays we would call Catholics, although they wouldn't have referred to themselves like that in the Middle Ages. They just would have called themselves Christian because there were no other types of being a Christian. However, in 1517, the Protestant Reformation began, 
uh, with a splinter group of, of people who disagreed with um, the way that the current church was operating. And over time, um, that splinter group splintered again and again, and we started to see many, many, many different ways of being a Christian in Europe. And in fact, um, the 1500s are, are an extremely bloody, brutal time uh, to be a European. There were frequent wars over the best way to be a Christian, Christians killing each other um, over what version of Christianity they believed in. Over time, whole countries tended to adopt one version of Christianity versus another. So we start to see this national religious identity start to emerge. And there's two main groups. There is the Catholic group and there is the Protestant group. So the Catholic group is essentially the um, version of Christianity that existed in the Middle Ages and those countries and people who stuck with that version of Christianity. And France, um, at least at the state level, um, kept with that version of Christianity. They had smaller um, other versions of Christianity within France, but they were persecuted and pushed out. Um, and and so really we're left with most of the French are just one type of Christian, which is called Catholic. All the other types of Christianity that came out of the Protestant Reformation are sometimes just simply labeled under the umbrella of Protestant. And so we say all Protestant Christians, but that's a little bit simplistic because um, within Protestant Christianity, there are many, many different types and they don't all agree. But generally speaking, though, Protestants are on one side and Catholics are on the other side. And England adopted a Protestant version of Christianity. The specific Protestant version of Christianity they adopted was called Anglicanism. But they did have other Protestant versions of Christianity, such as, as we said in the last slide, Puritanism, Quakerism, Presbyterianism, or other versions of Christianity, which we will put under the umbrella of Protestantism. But really the big divisions are between whether you're a Protestant country to begin with or a Catholic country. And in that sense, England and France are completely opposite. So they are different versions of Christianity. And during the 1500s, Europeans were constantly fighting and killing one another, really into the 1600s as well, over what type of Christianity they were. And this rivalry spilled over into their New World aspirations. So um, both countries, but particularly France, believed that it was part of their mission to convert as many of the indigenous people that they were meeting to the version of Christianity that they professed, which in this case was the Catholic version of Christianity. And so New France sent many, many, many missionaries uh, into the, um, you know, the indigenous territory surrounding New France to try to convert um, um, as many indigenous people as they could to their version of Christianity. And so by 1625, there's several religious orders, Catholic religious orders, um, including the Jesuits. The Jesuits was the most uh, populous of those religious orders. It's a, um, a Catholic religious order. The Jesuits were a type of priest within the Catholic faith and they were operating in New France by 1625. So that what they were doing is that they were setting up uh, little wooden churches in, in the woods essentially, and they were trying to convert indigenous people to their way of faith. And of course, you know, some indigenous people did convert and the very existence of the missionaries really did increase tensions between natives and Europeans. Of course, the indigenous people had their own religions, their own faiths. And um, the fact that the Europeans were coming in and telling them that their version of, of, of the world, their ideas of gods or spirits were all wrong. And that not only that, that according to these Europeans, they were going to be burning in an everlasting hell unless they adopted their version of Christianity must have at the very least not been super great for relations between the two peoples. However, some indigenous people did convert 
to um, the the uh, the French religion, the Catholic religion, religion, probably for a variety of reasons. Perhaps because um, it allowed them to have a closer relationship with the French. That means that maybe they might get better trading goods from them when they're trading for furs or whatnot. Um, uh, so for uh, probably there are some who converted because of genuine religious reasons. They've they felt called to that particular religion who knows um, but some did convert and of course uh, this created tensions between natives as well and in one particular way it created tensions between natives so natives who didn't convert and natives who did convert so within a group of people say within the Wendat a large group of the Wendat did convert to Christianity and a large group of the Wendat did not and remained faithful to their own belief systems um, and so this creates divisions within the tribes and Christianity also brought with it very different gender relations um, for men and women so in most of the indigenous cultures that um, the French were encountering men and women were much more equal um, in 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 their societies men and women were much more equal but in Europe at the time um, they were not at all uh, European cultures were very patriarchal which means that the men particularly the older men tend to hold all the power in the society uh, and this is reinforced by the Christian religion at that time which also sort of you know proscribed to both men and women very different roles of being a good person so women were expected to be good mothers and child rearers and men were expected to be the leader of their families and then when natives converted to this version of Christianity of course they were expected to adopt the same gender relations and so you can imagine then all the tensions and divisions then that this would create within native culture as some of the natives adopted Christianity so here you see a map which is sort of approximating uh, the different territories of the Huron and the Iroquois the Huron also known as the Wendat and the Iroquois also known as the Haudenosaunee so the Haudenosaunee five nation confederacy actually made up of five different uh, tribes including uh, the Mohawk and the Seneca and to the north the Wendat um, uh, was one group but then the Wendat also were allied with the Algonquin and these two uh, indigenous nations were great rivals had been bitter enemies for about a century or so when the French stepped right in the middle of their conflict and as we saw in the last podcast uh, the um, uh, Champlain in order to um, sort of secure the help and and friendship of the Algonquin and the Wendat he allied himself with them and actually helped uh, win a battle against the Haudenosaunee against the Iroquois and this meant that from that point onward the French had a friend but the French also had an enemy and this would have profound implications as time went on for the development of New France. So throughout the 1600s then, there is this sort of constant warfare between the Wendat uh, or the Huron versus the Five Nation Confederacy of the Haudenosaunee Iroquois. Um, and these wars continued well into uh, the mid part of the 17th century or the 1600s. Um, by 1630s, however, uh, the Wendat um, were kind of on the ropes, which is an expression to say that they were not doing very well. It's a boxing expression, meaning that, you know, when two boxers are going at it and one boxer is losing the match, they tend to sort of be hanging off the ropes at the edge of the ring. So the Wendat were not doing well by the 1630s for a bunch of reasons. So one, their close proximity to the French had brought with it um, increased... Uh, diseases from the French those European diseases which were wreaking havoc amongst all indigenous people had really um, devastated the Wendat by the 1630s and also because the Wendat um, some of them had converted to Christianity and some of them hadn't um, there were internal divisions within the um, indigenous tribe uh, so they there wasn't a huge amount of unity and all of that essentially led and 
for an opening that the Iroquois or Haudenosaunee Five Nation Confederacy could exploit. And, and in fact, by 1649, the Five Nations had completely destroyed Wendat and Huronia, Hur Huronia being the, the name that's applied to the territory of the Wendat, the territory of the Huron. So by 1649, it was destroyed. And that territory essentially was then claimed by the Haudenosaunee. Um, this is also where the French were living, and the French are the also the enemies of the Haudenosaunee. So you can imagine that the loss by the Wendat was not good for New France. It meant that now New France had to deal with increasing uh, raids against them, fighting against them, which they constantly had to put down. The Wendat themselves, the remnants of the Wendat um, uh, were essentially scattered to the wind, sadly. Uh, some of them um, uh, moved out towards uh, areas that the French controlled, such as Acadia. Some of them um, uh, found their way into other territories of, of other indigenous tribes who sort of took them under their wing. But the great uh, Huron or Huronia, the great time of their nation of sorts, was, was now a thing of the past after 1649. So by the mid-1600s then, things weren't looking great for New France. The population was relatively small compared to the now growing English colonies to the south. Um, and now they also had to contend with constant wars with the local indigenous tribes. Um, so a turning point really took place in the second half of the 17th century, when in 1664, the King of France, Louis XIV, took over direct control of the colonies. He believed that it was in his interest and the national interest to turn the, um, the fortunes of the colony around. Now, Louis XIV was a particular type of king. He was really a new type of king in Europe. He was what um, we call an absolute monarch, which means that he was very powerful. Absolutism means that all power is embodied in the king. Now, maybe you're thinking to yourself, isn't that kind of like what a king is? Well, actually, no. Most of the time and throughout the Middle Ages in Europe, kings were not really that powerful. I mean, think about it today. Is the Queen of England very powerful? No, of course not. Uh, she, you know, has to uh, basically acquiesce to whatever the elected parliament uh, wants to do. And during the Middle Ages, kings, um, although they were probably more powerful than, than the current Queen of England, they still didn't have that much power. And they pretty much had to rely on their alliances with the big, powerful barons and noble families to get anything done. Things really began to change as we moved into the early modern period after the 1500s, when kings slowly but surely became much, much more powerful. And the reasons why they became more powerful are really complex and I could teach a whole other class about that. Suffice to say that they do become very powerful. And we start to see these kings that really are like complete dictators, but they're not just like dictators. They are, um, because there's all this other you know, um, religious and social trappings surrounding kingship uh, that say a modern dictator doesn't have. So kings were thought to be anointed by God. They were thought to be second only to God. And if you were being faithful and religious, it was also your duty to be faithful to the king as well. And so all of that made kings like Louis XIV very, very powerful. And so what it means for practical considerations is when you have a good, smart king, then your country can do very well. But if you have a king who's inept, then uh, they, they won't do very well. So Louis XIV um, was very ambitious. I'll say that about him. He wasn't very good with money, but he was very ambitious. And he was constantly going to war in Europe. And he also, from 1664 onward, took a direct interest in the fate of his small little colony of New France. So what did he do? So from 1663 onward, there essentially was a representative of Louis, a sovereign council that represented him in the um, in New France. And he uh, sent direct instructions in some cases on on what should take place. He also, for the very first time, actually sent a military presence to New France. 
Um, prior to that, there weren't really any soldiers there. It was all fur traders and missionaries. So suddenly from the mid 1600s, 1660s onward, we actually have soldiers over there. And what this meant was that the Iroquois, or the Haudenosaunee, now um, had to contend with a well-armed um, resistance to their incursions. And really, they were forced to back down. And so the fighting between the Haudenosaunee and the French died down for about 20 years or so. So in that sense, uh, Louis XIV's um, uh, steps definitely stabilized that situation in New France, which was a problem for the growth of the colonies. But that wasn't the only thing he did, as we will see. So one of the problems that Louis XIV and his sovereign council had to contend with was the fact that uh, the population of New France was quite small compared to the population of New England. And the ultimate success of New France would depend on increasing the population to at least be somewhat more competitive against the growing colonies, uh, English colonies to the south. Now, let's think for a minute about why the English colonies had been successful in that regard thus far and why the French colonies had not. So the English colonies had um, focused on bringing whole families, encouraging whole families to move from Europe into New England. And the way they had done that is that they had gone to the religious minorities within England, um, who were um, versions of Christianity that was not the official version in the country. Um, so for example, Puritans or Quakers. And uh, the King of England essentially said to those uh, groups, um, I will let you practice your version of Christianity more openly. So you'll be able to not sort of have to hide it, which normally they pretty much would. There was only officially one religion, a uh, version of Christianity in England at the time, and other religions faced persecution and were oppressed. And, you know, so if you wanted to practice your faith openly, this was a really good option. The king would allow you to do so if you would move your family to the new world and thus help increase the population of New England. And this gambit was extremely successful. Um, whole communities pretty much picked up from England and moved across the ocean and set up shop in New England, cutting down forests, turning it into farmland, and essentially developing those 13 colonies along the English seaboard into little versions of England, albeit with now uh, different versions of Christianity. However, what was going on in New France at the time? Well, New France was focused on pretty much two things. The economics of colony, which was, uh, in this case, the fur trade and the fisheries, and the religious aspects of, of converting indigenous peoples. Um, so there was missionaries over there, lots of Christian priests, and there were lots of fur traders and fishermen, and not many families at all. Now, of course, France did try to encourage families to move over there, but there wasn't the same incentives. France really didn't have religious minorities in it, mostly because they had already been oppressed and kicked out of the country. Louis XIV in particular had uh, been um, quite brutal to any of the minority religious groups within the country. Um, there was one Protestant group called the Huguenots that was in France, and he pretty much kicked them out of the country. So that wasn't an option to the French to encourage religious minorities to move to the New World. So they had to figure out a way to get women to the colonies. Women were essentially the key to population growth. He needed women to move there to hopefully become wives of these fur traders and fishermen and thus set up um, families over there. And so how was he going to convince women to move to uh, the, you know, what from New France it was basically wilderness at that time? How would he encourage them to do so? So at that time, this is another sort of aside, but it's important. At that time, it was um, culturally impossible to get married in France or in, in fact, in many European countries at the time, if you were a woman and you did not have a dowry, a dowry. A dowry was a big lump sum of money that uh, was essentially a woman's inheritance from her father. And so if you were from a wealthy family, a wealthy woman would have a very large dowry, and the poorer you were, you would have less and less money. 
and every woman was expected to bring a dowry into a marriage. And if you didn't have a dowry because you were so poor that your family couldn't afford it, or perhaps you were an orphan, well then, tough luck. You're really, your options for getting married at that time uh, were very, very limited. And so you would be looking at a life of being a servant or a life of being a nun, which is like a Christian um, female version of a priest, I suppose. But or you, um, you know, a myriad of other, you know, professions, none of which were very nice. And that's it. Um, unmarried women legally had very few rights in France at the time. So, you know, getting married was important, but if you couldn't do it, you couldn't do it. So what the king of France said to poor women, particularly the poor women of Paris, is he said, I will be your father and I will provide a dowry for you. You will become a fille de roi, which literally means a daughter of the king. And in return, if you can move over to New France and marry fur traders, that would be great. And this actually worked. Lots of women took him up on the offer and became a fille de roi. And they moved over to the New World. And literally, when the women would get off the ships, there would be the, you know, the equivalent of like a meet and greet um sort of speed dating where all the local men would get out and they would have a chat with the women and you know there'd be like you know they'd have some food or drinks or whatever and hopefully romance would spark and they would pair up and they'd get married and they'd start to have lots of babies and it worked um the population of new france by 1700 had already grown as high as 15,000. And by 1759, it had grown all the way to 70,000. And this is a significant increase, and it was mostly because of the Fidoua. In fact, the Fidoua are such a significant um, uh, factor in the growth of New France that for just about every person in Quebec today who has French ancestry in the country, so anyone who actually claims French ancestry, you almost certainly have a Fidoua in your ancestry. One of your great, 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 great grandmothers uh, would have been a fille de roi. So this was an extremely successful way for New France to increase the population. So I just want to zoom out for a moment and take a look at the two parts of New France. There are two colonies within New France, Acadia and Canada. So Canada is the colony which is along the St. Lawrence River. It contains the settlements of Trois-Rivières, Quebec, Montreal, and Acadia is their very first colony, which is on the coast there. Um, it includes places like Port Royal. Um, Acadia now, if you're uh, wondering where that, what, where that is in modern day Canada, that is uh, considered um, Nova Scotia. Um, so what was the difference between these two places? Because they, I, I talked a little bit about their differences before, but they really start to become a lot more pronounced as time goes on. So in Acadia, despite it being the very first province, it remains relatively small in terms of population. Whereas after Louis XIV really starts to take charge, Canada, the population begins to expand. The Fidoua primarily moved to these settlements such as Quebec and Montreal and Trois-Rivières. And so this is where the focus has been on increasing the population. And so they start to really appear more and more different as time goes on. Acadia, in many ways, um, was a difficult for the king to establish the same sort of royal rule or royal oversight. Um, it really had a culture almost of sort of a, a wild west, like imagining cowboys on the wild west, but in this case, the wild east. Um, partially, this is because the colonists that live there had always had a very close relationship with the uh, indigenous people, the, particularly the Mi'kmaq. Um, uh, Mi'kmaq peoples. And in fact, there were even some intermarriages between uh, the two peoples. And so all of this made it difficult for the king to sort of impose uh, a microcosm of France on this very different type of colony. Whereas in Canada, we really start to see the very traditional European social hierarchy being replicated in Canada that everyone knew back home in France. 
So it's almost like the Canada becomes a mini version of France. It, the importance of church in the society, um, the importance of families, and one's social standing in life. So we have different hierarchies depending on what social class you are appearing in Canada. Whereas in Acadia, everyone was sort of at the same class and uh, it was very, very um, uh, much more sort of a wild um uh you know west type of environment even though it's in the east wild east so what was it like to live in new france well first of all new france was largely rural there were a few cities and towns but not too many the biggest settlements were of course along the saint lawrence river uh, the city of quebec the city of montreal trois rivières uh, but for the most part, though, it was very rural. And even along the St. Lawrence, um, what we see are, are many, many little farms. Um, in fact, really, New France really becomes a microcosm of society as it existed back home in France. And in particular, they really imported this um, landholding system that had dated back way into the Middle Ages in France, and that was seigneurialism. Seigneurialism is a system by which nobles or uh, seigneurs own the land. So they're the ones who actually control the land. And then they uh, essentially rent out that land to peasants who are known as habitants, habitants and seigneurs. So in uh, Canada, though, what that meant was that the habitants were essentially given land which often still was completely covered in forest. And the seigneur would expect the habitant to clear that land and to begin to farm it in order to make it productive and thus um, turn a profit for the seigneur. So for many French families who were habitants, they were living in very isolated homesteads uh, deep in uh, the Canadian wilderness, and uh, they spent their days in backbreaking labor, uh, clearing the land of forest, and then eventually making it farmable, only coming into town every once in a while. And this was how um, life in New France existed for a long, long time uh, until urban centers developed more so. The economy in New France took on uh, the same type of colonial economy that existed in New England and existed uh, in New Spain as well. And this type of economy was called mercantilism. And what mercantilism is strict government control, first of all, over the economy. But it's not like communism where the government owns everything. Really under mercantilism, you are told who you are allowed to do business with. And since all the European countries are essentially in competition with one another, their colonies become an extension of that competition. So New France became a market for goods that were manufactured in France. And uh, New France became the provider of a lot of raw materials that were needed back home in France. So for instance, timber. Um, New France would ship timber to um, uh, France and then France would send, you know, manufactured goods such, such as, say, pots and pans to New France and they would sell them to the colonists there. But under mercantilism, uh, you are not allowed to do business with other colonies that are not part of your country. And so even though New England is really close, far closer than across the ocean, New France and New England were not allowed to do trade with one another. And this creates sort of a weird economic bubble, mercantilism. Um, where, you know, even if, say, New England had tons of pots and pans, and in New France there was a shortage of pots and pans, they weren't able to sell to one another. So instead, if you were in New France and you needed a pot or a pan, you would have to buy it and have it shipped all the way from across the ocean. And this was mercantilism, and the, it was designed, in essence, as a form of economic competition. We don't want to give anything that will help our neighbor. We don't want to help the English and the English doesn't want to help France and so they're doing the exact same thing as the French and mercantilism would be the basis for colonial economies for centuries. In the 1700s, we begin to see New France expand, um, become bigger, at least in terms of territory that France claims or has some sort of presence upon. 
And in many ways, from a geographic standpoint, New France starts to become bigger than New England. And this is largely because of the activities of one group of people, the Curieux de Bois, which literally means the runners of the woods. The Curieux de Bois were un unofficial and independent fur traders. They were essentially individuals who decided to, you know, essentially start their own little business of sorts. And so they wanted to go deeper into the wilderness to find new indigenous tribes, perhaps some who haven't even been contacted by Europeans, and trade with them for furs. Now the reason why there would be an incentive to do this was because the indigenous people who lived closest to the French colonies um, they often were no longer hunting for the furs themselves because the fur bearing animals had all started to be hunted out of existence closest to the French colonies and of course the forest was being cut down and so if you were an indigenous tribe living close to the French you probably didn't get your furs yourself you probably bought them from other native groups who were further away and in turn those native groups probably bought them from other native groups even deeper into the wilderness where there were still plenty of fur bearing animals and so what happens is is every time there's a transaction of the furs being bought and sold the price essentially goes up so that by the time the furs reach montreal they're a lot more expensive than they were if you could go deeper into the wilderness and contact one of those indigenous tribes that was still hunting them you would get a much cheaper rate. And so that's what Courier de Bois essentially were doing. So these were independent French fur traders who were also adventurers and explorers. And so they were taking their canoes and going deep into the wilderness, particularly into the area of the Great Lakes. Um, so Lake Ontario, but also Lake Superior, um, Lake Michigan, all of the Great Lakes um, uh, were being um, set up with trading posts by the Courier de Bois. Um, this is sometimes called the um, in, in French. That was how they referred to all of this territory. Now, although this expanded French territory considerably, and if you look at the map up there in the upper left-hand corner, you can see New France is the blue area. It's starting to become quite large. Um, you shouldn't think of that as a fully developed colony. Much of that is really just wilderness. The really the only developed part of New France are the small settlements right along the St. Lawrence River and in Acadia. The rest of it is just untouched wilderness. Um, and what we have are French fur trading posts built deep into that wilderness by the Courier de Bois so that they can trade with other indigenous tribes. Now, this was a double-edged sword from the point of view of the royal authorities. On one level, they liked the idea that the French presence in North America was being expanded considerably. On the other hand, um, these were not official royal representatives and so the french government had no idea what they were essentially saying to these native tribes who hadn't yet been officially contacted by the french and so they might have been brokering deals they might have been making misrepresentations you just don't know and so royal officials found it very difficult to control what courier de bois were doing and so this was sort of a bit of a love-hate relationship with the activities of the Courier de Bois. The other problem is, is what the Courier de Bois was using to trade with the indigenous peoples. So obviously, you know, um, um, uh, uh, European metal goods were a very um, a valuable commodity to trade with indigenous people, but they're also quite heavy. And if you're traveling deep into the wilderness, you can't carry with you too many heavy iron tools, for example, to trade with the indigenous people. So what the Courier de Bois were often trading with was something with far more um, darker repercussions, and that is alcohol. And alcohol is something that, um, at least in the northern part of North America, there was no um, uh, cultural tradition of brewing alcoholic beverages. Many of the indigenous tribes had never encountered alcohol at all, had never encountered it. And so when alcohol was introduced into these social settings, it frequently caused quite a bit of social disruption to 
uh, those groups. Um, uh, as we all know, alcohol carries with it all kinds of terrible health risks and addiction, which of course are true of all peoples. But when it's introduced to a people who have no experience with dealing with that, obviously it can um, uh, it can exasperate things further. And this is what Curie de Bois were often using to trade with indigenous people. And so it wasn't necessarily the type of French presence which royal officials would have preferred. So this is um, that map that you saw on the last slide. It's actually a map from the mid 1600s. So this was right around when Heronia was destroyed um, by the Haudenosaunee and uh, shortly before Louis XIV took control of New France. And even at this point in New France's history, uh, you can see that the um, expansion of the zone of French contact and French influence is quite large and far larger than the zone of English influence. And this uh, would continue quite a bit. So the the region that Sheridan is based right now, which is, um, you know, north of Lake Ontario. So, you know, down in, in this region right here. Um, this obviously is part of that zone of French influence. And so it was the French were the first Europeans to be actively exploring and moving about in this area and interacting with the indigenous peoples here. And in fact, um, the very first European buildings built anywhere nearby Sheridan would have been uh, Fort Rouillet. And Fort Rouillet was built on the shore of Lake Ontario. It was essentially um, a trading post and a, a military outpost. And it was built around 1759, roughly uh, where um, the Canadian National Exhibition takes place in Toronto today. So if you've ever been to the Canadian National Exhibition, it happens every summer and it's a big fair with rides and all that sort of stuff. And uh, in fact, there is um, uh, a plaque where Fort Rouet once stood and you can go and see it. Um, so it's right off of downtown Toronto. And I'll show you a picture of what it looks like today. And this was the earliest European building of any sort in this area, and it was by the French. So this is an image of what it looks like today. Of course, the fort itself is long gone. Um, it's now a, a monument. Um, and there's the outline. There was an archaeological dig in the 1960s, and they, they found the remnants of the fort. And so the uh, the wall of the fort is actually marked in the grass with stones that outline the entire fort. And this is right here is in the center of the Canadian National Ex Exhibition grounds. And if you look uh, at the right, you'll see the CN Tower in the distance. So it's really quite close to downtown Toronto today. And here's a picture of my daughter um, on one of the cannons at uh, Fort Rouillet. Um, she actually is almost a teenager now. This is a picture from uh, quite some time ago. And so she might be grumpy that I put it in. But it's just so cute that I had to include it. So by the end of the 17th century, French institutions had taken root in North America, particularly Acadia and Canada. However, a network of indigenous trading alliances and trading forts had expanded the territory of New France considerably. Stretching from Labrador all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, New France geographically reached its greatest extent in the early 18th century. The colony of Louisiana, named after Louis XIV, the king we introduced you to earlier, was founded in 1682 and a colonial capital, New Orleans, was built by slave labor in 1718. Thus, in the mid-1700s, New France reached its height. It would only go down from here. Within just a few decades, France would lose all of its territorial possessions in North America. In the next unit, we'll be seeing how the British colonies fared, and we'll see how wars in Europe became wars in the colonies, and that would change everything.